If a brain-dead Italian mob clashed with a wounded 70-year-old man, each doing every imaginable no-no in the books, who would die first? I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the stupid gang in Equalizer 3. Oh yeah, Robert's back for blood in Equalizer 3, using what I can only imagine are even more Sherlock Holmes overcomplicated ways to kill his enemies while telegraphing his every move. Will the bads learn? Probably not. Maybe, with our help, we can finally put Denzel in the ground for good, and then circle back to reinstating Alina as bottom for that $10,000 a month Russian pimp paycheck. And that's after her 10% cuts paid out. Low overhead too, a threat against her life, a couple smacks to make her think you'll actually kill her, which you will, and you can drink all the Stoliknaya Elite Andian, or however you pronounce it, that you want. Wow, I even surprised myself with that one. I am a monster. Kann ich denn, kann ich denn anders? Hab ich denn nicht dieses verflucht in mir? I have a feeling Robert's gonna try to pay me a visit. And yes, I skipped Equalizer 1 and 2 because 3 is, like, newer and hotter. This time, Robert's in Sicily, Italy. Wait, I thought you lived in Boston. Bro thinks he's Team America World Police. We don't see him yet because he doesn't want us to. Five steps ahead of you at all times, remember? Accounting for every variable in existence. We start out following Lorenzo Vitali, a crime enforcer, and his grandson. They arrive at their winery home base, discovering their loyal henchman's corpses littered all over the place. I'm sure Robert gave them all a fair shake, as he does. An opportunity to choose the right path which they did not. Lorenzo tells his grandson to wait by himself in the car while he racks his pistol into felony carry and walks inside. It's okay. Word from the three surviving henchmen is that they caught the man responsible and are currently holding him captive in the dungeon. <laughs> right. If I got a call from two of my low-level goons that a nobody who viciously assassinated probably close to a dozen of my armed guards is now being held hostage by a couple of my cheap thugs, I'm not buying it, nor am I arriving with my f grandson. Please tell me your guards called you ahead of time. Clearly, this guy has intentionally thinned the herd to even the odds, leaving a few leftovers to capture him as bait so I, the head honcho, would arrive. Tell me if you've heard this one before. So I arrive. You offer a deal that's most likely so raw I couldn't possibly accept, like shutting down my criminal enterprise. Come on. I inevitably will decline. Incite you with a derogatory slur. You'll then start your stopwatch watch, mulch through my noob guards, then say something profound as the life drains from my body. It's time to think big and get mentally swole with today's sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant is an intuitive learning resource jam-packed with visual, interactive lessons in computational science, statistics, and mathematics for everyone, from beginners to advanced learners. Whether you want to nerd out about solar energy engineering or brush up on high school geometry, they have something for everyone. And it is a game changer for those of you in STEM programs. They've built each course with your time and mental load in mind. Lessons are fun, easy, and can be done in 15-minute sessions, but they're also addictive. Before you know it, you'll be halfway through their casino probability course and wondering how you can take out Le Chief for all he's worth, or plotting the perfect way to up your dice game come D&D night. Whatever your current skill level, Brilliant lets you both explore at your own pace and test out of material you already know, so you can cut right to the new exciting courses that fit you best. You don't have to shell out thousands of dollars and years of time to learn things that interest you now. And you can level up skills for work, to help your kids with their homework, or whatever you want. Right now, Brilliant is offering a free 30-day trial for nerds who use my link. Brilliant.org slash nerd explains. The first 200 of you who head over will also get an extra 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Big thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Knowing all this, my response would simply be, make sure he can't hear what I'm saying on the phone, then why does he not have a bullet in his head right now? But no, Lorenzo just has to hear this guy out. He's not completely stupid. His first question is, why are his remaining guards still breathing? Astute, but not the priority. This guy is unbound with a bottle next to him, clearly very proficient in hand-to-hand -hand fighting. Most likely hasn't been searched and stripped of guns since they didn't want to get close enough to him to tie him up in the first place, and all your dudes are in grabbing range with their guns pointed at their 
Have you guys never watched an action movie before? Get your guys to take a couple steps back. Homeboy is practically handing his revolver to him by being that close. Not to mention his gun is literally aiming at his buddy. If this goes south, which it will, half of you are dead from your own team's crossfire. The other two don't even have their guns aimed at him. Everybody who is not Robert needs to back into a firing line at the only entrance with guns trained on him. That includes you too, Lorenzo. No sh the most crucial mistake is that nobody stripped him of his watch. Robert is quick as f but only survives here because of poor positioning by the criminals, something he really couldn't have fully anticipated. As for the kid, well, Robert makes the mistake of not securing the scene, turning his back on Lorenzo's grandson, a military-aged child fueled by revenge. Rob's just lucky he didn't get aflacked like a triple frontier. Upon investigating the rifle he was shot with and the fact that he's not currently dead would indicate that this was a 22 long rifle. Survivable, given he gets some help quickly. Also survivable if he'd bothered to wear level three body armor with front and back plates, which would have easily stopped this round and any rounds fired from any of the other goons' weapons. Also survivable if he'd killed all the goons, hid the bodies, waited for Lorenzo to arrive at some point, kneecapped him and his grandson with a sniper rifle, secured the scene, then given Lorenzo his offer. I'd bet he'd be a lot more receptive to giving you the keys to the vault without a fight. You could then tell him to close shop or you'll finish him off. He'll retire, and then you can sleep a little better at night. I guess. My personal strategy would be to recce the area for a few days to gather numbers, firepower, and positions. Then devise a lure outside, mow down the exterior guards with suppressed subsonic rifle fire, wait for the interior guards to come out for fresh air eventually, pop them, then once I'm at full tally, do a sweep to be sure. Secure the bodies and weapons, given each a triple tap to be sure. Then crack the safe with thermite. Rather than paying a vet off to dig the bullet out, he considers taking the easy way out, but no bullets. Lucky for us. So he gets in his car and tries to drive somewhere, hopefully toward that vet. I'm guessing hospitals are out, given the ensuing investigation would likely land him in bars for the rest of his life. He doesn't make it far, slipping into unconsciousness from shock. Moments from death alongside a coastal road, he's found and rescued by Gio, an honest policeman not on Lorenzo's payroll, and brought to a small town doctor, Enzo, that same night. Miraculous. Robert makes a near full recovery within three days, save for needing a cane. He doesn't even get invoiced for the treatment. Apparently digging that bullet out of his ass was on the house. Nice folks. Robert takes a nice stroll down to the local cafe for some tea, where he's visited by Gio and his daughter Gabby. No questioning, no paperwork, no digging through his belongings. A mutual understanding that he simply had a bad fall and some parting Girl Scout cookies to boot. God damn, this place is awesome. Robert then makes an anonymous phone call to CIA officer Emma Collins to tip her off about the winery's illegal drug trade in Sicily. Apparently, Lorenzo's operation based out of a winery in Sicily thought importing drugs from Syria disguised as wine boxes was a smart play. And apparently, Robert thought tipping the CIA off to a dozen slaughtered decomposing corpses a few hour ferry away from his current location was also a smart play. What's the point? They're all dead. It's not like you need the CIA to handle business. If anything, they're going to get in your way or put you in prison. Smashing your burner phone doesn't really help when they're going to be sniffing around that entire area looking for the concerned citizen passing by. You know what they're going to find? Lorenzo's grandson. You know what he's going to say? Late 60s black man. Kind of narrows it down here a little bit, don't you think? Not a good move when you're planning on making this your new home. While out on a midday stroll, Roberto overhears the local gang, the Camoras, taking their cut from a sea food restaurant. Bread and butter for Robert, if he hadn't gotten shot in the back a week ago. The head enforcer, Marco Quarenta, links back up with his big bro, Vincent Quarento. He's the head honcho. They're just wrapping up a little business deal gone sour. This lovely couple refused to vacate their premises so Quarento could set up a hotel front. Their mistake was thinking they had a god 
choice. The price for this mistake? Grand Poppy Hector Salamanca gets the bungee jump out of the third story window with a utility rope around his neck. I'm guessing the papers got signed. Pro tip, don't decline deals from the mafia. They'll just kill you and take what they want anyway. Vincent tells Marco that they have big plans to build resorts, casinos, and hotels all along the coast. And to do that, he needs Marco to put pressure on the locals. While Roberto is out mingling with the locals, Collins and her team are coming through Lorenzo's winery. Sure enough, the Syrian wine bottles are filled with phenethylene hydrochloride tablets. Collins remarks, Externally. Synthetic amphetamine. ISIS fighters use it. Yeah, they also use gasoline. They also found $11 million in cash. What's also clear is that they were oblivious while Mr. Ninja Nobody single-handedly dismantled it. The only way to know how is to find this anonymous caller. Roberto returns to his village later that night to find people panicking in the streets and Angelo's restaurant burning to the ground. A message to the other business owners. Pay up or burn up. Robert knows he can't act out right now. He needs to bide his time until he heals up and the CIA spooks he just alerted to his location leave. Unlikely to happen anytime soon though. It's all good, in addition to the cops not imprisoning him. The free healthcare for Menzo, the free food for Angelo, the local stunning 30 years younger than him cafe owner, Amina, asks him out on a date. Now I know Denzel wrote this part of the script. Despite the burning, everything seems to be on the up and up. Robert may have finally found a new home where he belongs, where he can be at peace, which means we're about to take a hard ride off the road. While at the diner, Colin sits across from him. She points her camera at him and snaps a few pics. Somehow, Robert notices. Could it have been a single new Caucasian female face in a small close-knit Italian village wearing dark sunglasses to read while indoors? Kind of like the one he talked with on the phone. Could it have been her iPhone awkwardly aimed at his face from six feet away? Could it have been the obvious audible shutter sound effect played while awkwardly aiming her phone at him? Gee, I don't know. How are you even employed by the CIA as a field agent? If you needed a face to run through the database to assess who this killing machine is, why not place a hidden camera somewhere on his usual path while staying as inconspicuous as possible by keeping distance? It's a bit of tense confrontation with a couple dry jokes about jurisdictional authority and black site torturing that ends rather politely. Could have gone way worse with a suspicious hardball agent, someone like her boss that's far less interested in the see what happens approach that she's taking. Like I said before, this is a risk I don't think he should have taken. He doesn't need them anyway. When he returns home from tea time, he sees Gio's bludgeoned mug getting patched up by Enzo. Seems the mob didn't take too kindly to his investigation into the license plates on the van that they used for the firebombing. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty naive move on Gio's part. Of course they had higher ups on the payroll. Sucks to say, but getting involved at your level and lack of skills is a recipe for disaster. Lucky for him, Roberto just graduated from his cane. Later that evening, Gio and fam get another visit from Marco. He tells Gio he needs him to requisition some boats for the Camoras. The whole time, Marco's getting a discomforting stare down from Robert, so he pays him a visit too. Doesn't quite go like he was expecting. Robert grabbing Marco's wrist and compressing his median nerve is an interesting play. Robert sat with his back to the wall, with Marco's two goons both in front of him, and Marco held hostage. He motions with his hand for them to sit down. They don't know Robert, but being an older, quiet man who is skilled and bold enough to initiate this takedown, you can guess he's got an ace up his sleeve. Or, seeing that one hand is tied up with Marco and his other outstretched toward you, motioning for you to sit back down, these two have good odds in a draw. What they also have are plenty of of their own hostages, with plenty of innocence behind and around them that would make it risky for Robert should he choose to return fire with a concealed handgun. The Camoras have shown that they run this place, are above the law, and have little concern for violence and collateral damage. This situation could go very bad for Robert and everyone else in this establishment. It wasn't a very good move to show your hand and force a confrontation. You'd have been better off submitting
anything to Marco to retain his unassuming gray man status and element of surprise. Then worked with Geo to discreetly get more info on the Kimuras as well as their criminal boat requisition operation. Then staged an ambush there. Let's see how Robert's plan plays out. Oh, he has Marco tell his compadres to leave instead of shoot him. Surprisingly, they leave. Then he instructs Marco to pull his pistol out of his waistband and place it on the table while literally sweeping Robert with the muzzle. Let's see that one more time. Robert knowingly had this thug muzzle sweep him after he initiated the physical attack. Marco doesn't even need the law on his side. One quick trigger squeeze, and there'd be no realistic way for Robert to react, and he'd have been the one equalized. <laughs> oh, I forgot. He's compressing the median nerve. It gets better. Robert releases Marco, then shoes him off back to his thugs so he can get back to his meal. All three return and gun him down, sending a message that nobody disrespects the Kamoras and lives. Nope. In the movie, they, they just leave in order to get a van to go back and execute him, which makes no sense. At least Robert knew they'd retaliate anyway and proactively attack them. Jesus, man, really savored that last one, huh? Well, I guess that settles that. A stark lesson in why you don't give your enemies time. The Naples head of police is summoned to Vincent Quarento's estate where he breaks the bad news. The CIA is here looking for the terrorist cell in Sicily importing Syrian drugs to fund terrorist attacks across the EU, and that it's only a matter of time before they figure out that the Comoras are behind it. Vincent tells him to take care of it, which is a ridiculous thing to tell a head of police that he needs to blow off the CIA. Yeah, I don't think it works like that, bud. Unfortunately, this head of police can only be the messenger of bad news, of the CIA intrusion, and of his lack of knowledge surrounding the murder of his brother Marco. And like all messengers of bad news, It certainly didn't help that he called Vincent a barbarian that needed to know his place. What is with people sh talking in someone else's hood where you have zero power? Wait until you get back to the station, then sick that SWAT team onto the Kimuras. Disrespect his family. Like you said, the Kimura's time is up, and being an Italian, it's about time to switch teams. Vincent, now knowing the CIA is here looking into their business, has a car bomb wired up for Collins. Collins is lucky to have survived. Had she walked and talked, she'd be giblets. Before she goes into surgery, she tells her colleague Frank that this was the Kimura's doing. Gio's not having a great day either. Instead of packing up and bugging out until the Kimura's are ended, he makes the honorable, stupid ass decision to stay, knowing full well Vincent will rip his tongue out through his neck and hang his family. Vincent demands to know who killed his brother. The silence is deafening. <laughs> Now Robert chooses to come out of hiding. Jesus, man, a little late. That first one could have been through his eye for all you know. And now your big bad monologuing plan is to have Vincent execute you in the street too. You do realize that won't stop anything. In fact, it'll empower him even more, make him even more violent. I understand you have a death wish, but you're putting the people you love in more danger. McCall is only saved by Enzo whipping out the Carcano, and the crowd whipping out their iPhones. Gee, who Who'd have thought a public execution would be bad for business? Have a little patience. Let the head of police get you your answer. Interrogate the officers involved in the investigation in private. Or my favorite, bag that new guy in town that looks nothing like the locals. At minimum, don't be the dude holding the gun yourself. You have thugs for that who can take the fall for you. What I also don't understand is how 50 cameras recording a high profile figure shooting, torturing, threatening, and sticking guns in innocent people's faces is not enough to get someone like, say, the Grupo de Intervento Speciale to turn their op into Swiss cheese. Vincent and the Camoras are dumb, but not dumb enough to massacre the town with all these cameras. They pack up and haul out of there. Remember what I said about giving your enemies time? The Camoras had no reason to leave Robert there. He was the main threat. It had been trivial to put a firing squad on him, have one guy disarm himself to find Robert securely, put a bag over his head, throw him in the van, and bring him back for questioning, aka torture, aka killing him. Roberto and the town are now under the crosshair. See, this is why I wanted Robert to do his research, infiltrate the dealers, find the suppliers, and take them all out in a timely fashion. He heads back to his room to grab his 
watch. By now you'd think you'd have swiped some body armor from Geo, acquired weaponry of some sort, something more than heading into battle with a watch. This would be a big problem if his enemies didn't leave to just go eat spaghetti and sleep. <laughs> what the f- That's a good thing to have, competent security guards. Wow, literally a must have been the wind video game bot. They even have the send one guy to check on it bot too. And all the windows are conveniently unblocked, unlocked, and or open like in Splinter Cell. Get this, they also have the oh no, a body, let me put my gun away and run over to tunnel vision on him while the person who's killed him sneaks up on me, bot. <laughs> Vincent finally awakens from his slumber to a dead man falling through his ceiling. Instead of barricading up in his room with his submachine gun, he goes to check on every corpse in the house while yelling his friends' names and shooting up all the walls, thereby constantly beaconing his position to the killer and prematurely emptying his magazine, securing his face's position at the end of Robert's buttstock. OD'd on his own product, Vincent perishes in the street. Roberto goes to check on Collins at the hospital while she watches the news of the CIA and Interpol's successful capture of most of the synthetic amphetamine drugs imported from Syria. An undeserved self-congratulation. Ultimately, the Camorra gang could have gone on to be a successful tyrannical mafia in Italy had Marco shot Robert in the head at that restaurant. For that reason, I think Equalizer 3 was beaten. Moral of the story, don't give your enemies time. <laughs>